Okay, welcome to Politics and Prose Live. We are here tonight with Sonia Shah. And um, before we get started, I just have a few quick housekeeping notes. The first thing I wanna say is um, we really encourage everyone to ask a question during the question and answer portion of our event. And you can do that by clicking on the Q&A uh, box down at the bottom of your Zoom window. So click on that and type in your question and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. And the second thing is we really encourage everyone to purchase Sonia's book, The Next Great Migration, which you can do uh, via a link in the chat, which I have just posted. And uh, that's a great way to support our author and to also support politics and prose. Now, with that out of the way, um, it is my delight to welcome Sonia Shaw. She is a science journalist and prize-winning author. Her writing on science, politics, and human rights has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Affairs, among many others. She has also been featured on Radiolab, Fresh Air, and TED.com with her talk, Three Reasons Why We Still Haven't Gotten Rid of Malaria. And she is also the author of several acclaimed books, including The Fever and Pandemic. Tonight, she'll be talking about her new book, The Next Great Migration, which provides an in-depth overview of migration and the often negative responses that it provokes. While some media figures and politicians may claim that migration is a destructive force, she argues that migration is actually an ancient and life-saving response to environmental change. And the book makes the case for a future in which migration is not a source of fear, but of hope. So without any further ado, here is Sonia. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I wish I could see you in person, but I'm glad we can do this at least. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the background of how I came to write this book. Um, I, my last book was called Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. And before that I had written other books about malaria and uh, other aspects of global health, specifically focusing on contagions. And so after my last book was finished, which was around 2015, it came out in 2016, but I finished writing it in 2015. This was right around the time of the quote unquote migrant crisis in the Mediterranean when there was just all these people leaving Syria and Afghanistan and they were trying to you know, get a running away from uh, bombings and beheadings and strife and poverty. And they're trying to get up into Europe. And many of them were getting stuck in the Mediterranean. There was drownings and people were getting stuck in refugee camps and detention centers and European countries were closing their borders sort of one at a, you know, just one at a time in a domino kind of effect. And having written a lot about um, how populations on the move can cause disease and uh, microbes and animals and, and people moving around can be quite disruptive to public health. I went to Greece to report on the what I thought of the migrant crisis, everyone was calling the migrant crisis, um, because I thought there might be a risk of disease outbreaks. You know, these are people who are fleeing places where vaccination campaigns had failed or collapsed. Um, they're under stress. They're moving into new parts of the world where there are different, you know, disease environments, different kinds of populations with different immune status. And so I thought, well, all this, this mass movement of people is surely going to trigger disease outbreaks. So I went to Greece to do reporting on that, thanks to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, which has supported a lot of my work. And um, was doing an interview with uh, a physician from Doctors Without Borders. And I said something along the lines of, um, you know, what are, what are some of the worst effects of the migrant crisis in your opinion? Some, something like that. And he stopped and he said, there is no migrant crisis. And I was quite puzzled and I said, well, there's all this tumult and there's, you know, people are dying and drowning and people are getting stuck in refugee camps and everyone's upset. Um, so, you know, what's happening then? If it's not a migrant crisis, what is it? And he said, it's, it's not a crisis of migration because there are plenty of jobs for these people if they wanted to take them. There's plenty of room, there's capacity to house them, there's accommodations. Um, it's probably better for them if they move. It might, be, it might contribute to the resilience of the societies that they left behind that they move. They might contribute to our societies if they move. So the crisis is not of migration. The crisis, he said, is of welcome, of reception. 
And I realized then that I hadn't really asked any of those questions that he was talking about. Um, I had reflexively decided that if there's migration, it must be some kind of crisis. And in fact, what I, what I learned about the disease status is that there were no disease outbreaks except for the ones caused by the conditions that these people were being kept in. So they were being detained in you know, unsanitary uh, camps and makeshift uh, you know, squats at you know, in, uh, abandoned schools and abandoned stadiums and things like that. And just by virtue of those conditions, there were some outbreaks of things like scabies and chickenpox. Um, but uh, but there but it hadn't you know there hadn't been any other ma other outbreaks that spread, and what I learned is that a lot of migrants actually are healthier than the host populations they enter, and that's a well documented phenomenon called the healthy migrant effect. And so this kind of started me thinking about migration in a new way. Um, I wanted to understand why did I immediately conflate migration with crisis? That was very reflexive for me. Um, and you know, I think this really is, is a very personal issue for me too. Although I'm, I, I'm not a xenophobe by any stretch, and I, you know, I'm the daughter of immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself. I, you know, my family lived in Australia for a few years. Uh, my parents are immigrants from India who, who settled here in the United States before I was born. But I think I had very much internalized the idea of migration as disruptive, and that that kind of came out in, in my work, you know, as a, as a journalist, as a science journalist, I've been writing for a long time about the disruptive effects of people on the move um, and microbes on the move and animals on the move, you know, in the form of contagions of various kinds. Um, but I think even for myself, like my identity, I had internalized that idea of <clears throat> my own body in place, my own body on the North American continent, you know, the product of this act of long distance migration that my parents undertook um, was somehow problematic. It was somehow weird, exceptional, anomalous. Um, and I think that expressed itself in the way I would never really call myself a full American. You know, although I was born in New York City, I, you know, I, I've lived here all my life, except for those few years in Australia. Um, so uh, I never called myself a, an American, you know, just a straight American. It was always some kind of American, a South Asian American, Asian American. Um, you know, there's some kind of uh, permutation of an, of an American. You know, I think all, all, you know, throughout my childhood, I'd been told by people around me that I didn't quite belong. Uh, you know, I would, I, I was, and this is a very common experience, I think for a lot of um, people of color in this country that were asked, you know, where are you from? And I would say, well, I'm from New York because that's where I was born and I grew up there when I was little. And they would say, no, no, where are you really from? You know, because you can't really be from New York. You're obviously an outsider, a foreigner of some kind because you don't look right. And I got that same response when I was in India with my relative, when I'd visit India, you know, to see my relatives and things. And, and they similarly would make it very clear that I, uh, didn't talk right, didn't uh, wear the clothes right, didn't eat the food right, um, you know, that I was alien in some way. So I had a very much internalized this idea that I, I didn't belong and I traced it back to that act of international long distance migration that my parents had undertook. And I think that really colored how I looked at migration. So I, um, I wanted to interrogate that idea and that is what was, you know, that was the spark that became the process that resulted in this book. Um, and I traced it back to this idea of things belonging in certain places, you know, this idea that certain people belong in certain places, that's where they're from, that's where they belong, they've evolved there, they've adapted to those places. Um, and we think of that, you know, in, in terms of people, but also in terms of animals. It's why we have those animal maps that we give to our kids where the camel stands in for the Middle East and the kangaroo stands in for Australia and the bear stands in for North America because the underlying idea there is those animals belong in those places to such an extent that they're actually almost one and the same. So, you know, these aren't specific ideas about migration but they very much erase 
the history of migration, because it's to say if the camel is from the Middle East, it's never moved, it's always been there, it never will move. Um, in fact, what we now know is that none of that is true. So anyway, I, I trace this idea of uh, everything belonging in a certain place back to the 18th century naturalist, uh, the Swedish naturalist, Carl Linnaeus. And that's sort of the historical moment that I, they anchor this book around. And he was a very interesting character. Um, he, like a lot of naturalists at the time, he was very religious. Um, and so he saw nature as sort of an expression of God's perfection. And so what he took, you know, this was a time in the 18th century in Europe where um, Europeans were traveling as never before. They were, you know, discovering the new world, discovering uh, uh, Polynesia, parts of Africa, you know, the, the whole world was kind of opening up to Europeans through trans, uh, transoceanic travel for the, for the first time. And so there was just this wealth of biodiversity and human diversity that was confounding to, you know, the, uh, European society at the time. And so there was this big effort to figure out, well, what are all these things, all these different species and animals and peoples who look quite different from us? Where do they all come from and where do they belong? What is their origins? How, how did they get to these places? And Linnaeus was among many naturalists at that time who tried to answer that question. Now, the way he answered the question is to say, well, wherever we found them, that's where they belong. Because for him, of course, nature is an expression of God's perfection. Everything is in its place where God put it. So just by, you know, just by the logic of that, it was impossible that anything would go extinct or that anything had moved in the past or that anything would move in the future. So he pictured a nature and uh, a natural world and an, an order in nature that was very stable and very still. And we, and he created a taxonomy. He named thousands and thousands of species and he came up with a system of classifying and naming creatures that we have retained to this day. So Linnaean taxonomy is the basis, formed the basis for all of our modern inquiries into nature and biology. Of course, it's changed in many ways, but the, some of the essential fundaments of it are, are the same. He also categorized humans. So this was a big um, open question in 18th century European society. Well, how did Africans become so dark? You know, they were very certain that these people from Asia and Africa and, and the Americas were savages and, you know, not fully human or not as human and evolved as they were. But that was very problematic intellectually because, you know, this was, they were coming out of the Christian tradition and all humans in the Bible, you know, uh, descended from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So if that was true, then how did they become so you know, what Europeans thought were so strange looking. Why do they have such strange practices that they considered very uncivilized and savage? So Linnaeus didn't tackle that question head on, but he did in part. So what he, what he said is, well, he's not, um, he's not gonna go in, he doesn't go into where they came from, how they got there, but he says very clearly, and he came up with his human taxonomy and he said very clearly, that those other people are not the same as us. They are biologically distinct. And he came up with a system of classifying humans in which there were four subspecies of humans. There was a subspecies of um, humans that were Europeans. And then there was a separate subspecies of yellow people who were Asians, of red people who were Americans and of black people who were Africans. And he gave these long Latin names, you know, for each of these, what he called subspecies. And in fact, he actually said that Africans were maybe not even as human as the other subspecies. He speculated in some of his private papers that um, Africans might be a cross between um, this monstrous kind of humanoid that he, he called them troglodytes. These were this is you know, not something that's real that we understand today as real, but he decided that there was this whole other category of, of human-like species that were you know, albinos, people with 
you know, um, who, who had gigantism, different kinds of genetic conditions, what we would say today as genetic conditions, but he categorized those all as one category of kind of monsters, human monsters that he called troglodytes. And he thought the African subspecies was a cross between troglodytes and real humans. And it was, it was so interesting looking into all of his, um, you know, the, the basis for how he put this all together because he actually was not somebody who traveled very much. He hardly left Sweden. He, he was very provincial. He actually didn't like to hear any other languages other than Swedish and he would kind of frown if somebody, uh, you know, spoke to him in French or wrote something in French or um, any other language, he, 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 you know, he hated it and he didn't like to travel, he didn't like to go anywhere. So what he would do, and this wasn't uncommon at the time, a lot of early biological investigations were really based on, you know, specimens and dead things and collections. So he would get collections and he would, um, you know, examine them. And there was, at that time, it was a common thing that explore, European explorers would go to different places and they would capture people and bring them back to Europe to put them on display as specimens of, you know, these other subspecies. So they would have African women on display in museums and traveling exhibits and scientists would go to these exhibits and poke and prod these women as if they were not human like themselves um, and you know the the Ven the hot and tot venus is one of the most famous examples which i discuss in the book but so this idea of you know people being separated being belonging to different places to such a degree that we're actually biologically alien from each other it really um erased any notion that we could have migrated so the more differentiated we are the less possible it becomes to imagine a history of migration in which we all started in one place and moved around and mixed and, and all of that. And so Linnaean taxonomy kind of set the stage. And then that was passed down into all of our future, you know, uh, um, inquiries into all uh, various questions in biodiversity and human diversity. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, people, scientists were really racking their brains to try to figure out how exactly the human subspecies were different. You know, there's a lot of activity, a lot of scientific inquiry into, well, what exactly makes Africans so different from us? What, what are the biological criteria so that we can define us different from them. And it was very difficult because of course we're not different. Of course we are all the same. We're all of one human family. So, but they tore, they put themselves into knots trying to figure out, well, you know, maybe it's if you measure the skull, the circumference of the skull and divide it by the height from the top of the skull to the, you know, your sit to, to your, uh, the, your back when you're sitting, your, they, they had all these different measurements they would do of your bodily uh, dimensions and try to pinpoint, okay, this is the way they're different. Okay, this is the way they're different. Um, and, and none of it really worked, but, uh, but, th but that was a very, very active area of inquiry at that time. Um, and there was huge worries among some of the leading scientific figures in the early 20th century in the United States, like Madison Grant, who the founder of the Bronx Zoo, um, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the curator of the American Museum of Natural History, uh, they uh, organized huge conferences, international conferences, where they would get scientists from all over the world together to try to figure out how exactly are all these racial groups different and what would be the impact if we were to allow them to migrate and mix around together. And, you know, so they were very, very worried when the era of mass migration started in the United States, when people started coming over from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and all these different parts of the world started coming into um, the Americas in the 19th century. And a lot of these scientists thought that that was biologically dangerous. Uh, President Calvin Coolidge actually said that there was biological laws that prevented um, people who were born in different continents from mixing or melding with each other. Uh, the director of the, the president of the American Public Health Association in the 1920s said, if the United States was to allow immigrants in who came from these other racial groups, these other subspecies, that that would bring absolute ruin to society. And 
uh, there was this big conference in New York all about this race science and eugenics and how immigration was gonna be really dangerous and the biological hazard of immigration. And after that conference, which was organized by Madison Grant and Henry Fairfield Osborne, uh, they you know, brought, put all the exhibits together and shipped them off to Congress. And they were exhibited in the halls of Congress for every member of Congress to look at as they walked into their chambers. And the leading scientists who created that conference, including Madison Grant, sat on a, created a committee and they drafted a policy that was based on the cutting edge science of, you know, that traced its heritage back to Linnaean tax taxonomy about how different peoples who lived on different continents belonged there and were biologically alien from each other. And if they mixed, that it would be, you know, catastrophic. It would be a, a biologically hazardous for the nation. And they drafted those laws and that is actually what became that was brought into Congress, introduced into Congress and passed, and that was our 1920s immigration laws, which were based on racial quotas and, you know, had very strict racial quotas, um, basically said no one from Asia can come, no one from Africa can come, and those laws were in place in the United States up until the 1960s, so really shaped the face of the nation. Um, so there was all these fears about immigration. At the same time, I think there was a lot of um, just underestimation about what migration is and sort of the scale of it. Um, one, one fun example, a story that I tell in the book is about the, the Contiki raft. And this was, um, so this is about Polynesia and how in, uh, you know, in the early days of European exploration, James Cook, Captain James Cook made his way to these very remote islands in, in the Pacific of Polynesia. And it took a lot of navigational prowess to get there for him. You know, he had these big ships and he had these fancy compasses and he had all the latest sort of devices and know-how to try to navigate to these very distant islands in the middle of the oceans. Uh, it's very difficult to get to those places. Well, he figured it out and he got there. And then he was amazed to find, well, there's people there already, tons of people. All the islands were already populated with you know, these Polynesian peoples had gotten there and you couldn't understand it because he said, well, they only have stone age technology. How could they have possibly gotten here? You know, and, and it, it, he couldn't fathom the idea that, you know, that people had actually migrated to these, you know, these very remote islands. And the people there, of course, were like, well, no, we, we, we paddled on canoes. Our ancestors paddled on canoes from Asia and, and they got here and that's why we're here. You know, and Cook and all of the European explorers who followed him to the Polynesia said, well, no, they just did not buy it. They're like, that cannot be true. Uh, these people have Stone Age technology. Those canoes could never do it. Um, if, you, if you travel from Asia to, the Poly to Polynesia, you're going to be going against the prevailing winds, against the prevailing currents. So there's no way they could have migrated here on their own. Um, so there was this huge conundrum of like, well, how did they get here? You know, and this was like a huge mystery, a scientific mystery for many decades. So in the 1940s, Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer, um, he ended up in Polynesia and he came up with a novel explanation for how Polynesia must have been settled. And his idea was he figured out that there was a current an ocean current that ran from the coast of Peru down into Polynesia. And he imagined that, well, perhaps if there were some, you know, people fishing or something like that off the coast of Peru and they got swept up in a storm and then just by accident, they drifted on this current all the way to Polynesia. And maybe that's what happened. And he called them, he called them, uh, you know, this accidental migration of white gods, that's what he called them, um, that these white gods maybe accidentally drifted over to Polynesia and then they slowly populated the islands. Of course, this didn't explain why all the people of Polynesia had, you know, all these linguistic and archeological ties to Asian countries, why they all seem to be related to each other. They all had similar languages. You know, there's lots of things that this theory did not explain. Nevertheless, it became hugely popular in part because Thor Heyerdahl actually decided to try this out himself. And he, um, 
he built a balsa wood raft in Peru and he got a crew of three or four other Norwegian, young Norwegian scientists. And they set off from the coast of Peru and they drifted for I think two or three weeks. Um, and there were sharks coming up around them and you know, they, they whales would come and look at them and they had this, they had all these adventures, crazy adventures. Um, drifting for all these weeks. And they finally did land on some outer island in the Polynesia and they thought, okay, we've proved it. That's what happened. That must have been what happened. And uh, he wrote a book about it. He um, did a film about it, a documentary about it that won the Academy Award, a, document, a documentary on Polynesian migration through the Kontiki. This, the, the name of his raft was Kontiki. Um, and, and this really captured, you know, captured the world's attention uh, for, for many years. Um, so, so, and, you know, and it was only later, only in recent years that we've uncovered the true story through archeological evidence, genetic evidence, linguistic evidence, et cetera, that indeed, yes, the Polynesians did uh, come over from Asia and they did it into ancient times and they probably used canoes. What we now know is that um, ancient Polynesians and Polynesians today practice a traditional form of navigation called wayfinding. And it allows them to navigate with as much accuracy, if not more accuracy than modern Western navigational technology does. And this is a way of understanding how to plot a course through a featureless ocean by taking thousands of observations a day um, from the behavior of fish, the behavior of uh, birds, uh, you know, the stars, of course, um, cloud patterns, all different things. There's, there's sometimes when they would lie down on their backs on the, on the floor of their canoes to feel the ocean swells. And, and from the feeling of those ocean swells, they could detect where hidden land masses were like out in the distance where you couldn't see them. This was an amazing, amazing uh, way of learning that uh, took a lifetime to figure it out. You had to learn it from your parents. It was passed down, you know, generation to generation. And it was semi-religious, it was kind of a sacred practice. So the Polynesians were never, never told the Europeans about it. So the Europeans were like, oh, you could never do this. You don't have, uh, you know, you don't have a compass. You don't have all these great things we do. And, and they, in fact, they did, but they couldn't tell, they couldn't tell these outsiders because this was sacred knowledge, you know, for their own cultures. Um, another example is uh, a, a story which I tell in the book too is about um, uh, bird migration. And bird migration was also, I mean, you would think today that we would understand that birds are migrating all the time, we see them. But in fact, uh, during World War II, um, this is when uh, the British st first started using radar installations. And they had radar installations all up and down the coast to detect enemy planes. And they would find these uh, rate, these signals would occur um, at night. Uh, they'd see little blips and then, you know, it looked like enemy planes were coming. And so they'd go onto red alert and they would send out their fighter jets to like fly out over the sea and look for these oncoming enemy planes. And they'd go out there and nothing would be there. They'd come back and the radar analysts would say, well, you know, those, those echoes were there. And then they just sort of uh, dispersed into a circle and then another circle and then they just disappeared. You know, it made no sense. And these were like sh echoes of objects that were flying against the wind um, at night over the ocean, over the sea. And, uh, you know, ornithologists at the time, a few ornithologists at the time were said, you know what, I think those, that might be birds migrating. And uh, the military officials were just like, no, that, that can't be no bird could do that. Birds can't fly at night. That was a conventional idea back then. Birds can't fly at night, they'd crash into trees. So that can't possibly be birds. So what they decided those echoes were, and this wasn't just the British who had this problem um, during on military radars, it was a whole phenomenon. All, you know, the Germans had this issue too with their radar that they would find these echoes and they couldn't figure out what it was. And so they came up with this uh, idea that these must be echoes of uh, dead soldiers from beyond the grave, sort of, you know, sending a little signal. Um, and they call them radar angels. And that was uh, the, the explanation for, for many years until ornithologists finally followed some radar, supposed radar angels, and saw that, uh, traced them back to a tree 
that was covered in starlings. And then as they were watching, they saw the starlings all lift up all at once as one, you know, as, as sort of in one phenomenon together and then land on another circle of trees in a concentric circle around the first trees they were on, just like the, ra the radar angels and those strange signals had shown. So they finally proved that it was birds migrating on the wing. Um, but so, in, so there's two sides of this. We've, we've minimized the, the amount of migration that is around us, you know, and we've also um, emphasized the negative aspects and exaggerated the negative aspects. And you can see the um, legacy of that today, where, for example, in this recent pandemic, where we had uh, this outbreak of virus in Wuhan, China, and the first response of many policymakers was, well, close down the borders, don't let any of those people in, and then we'll be fine, right, that this will keep it out. And that was such a huge underestimation of the vast amount of human mobility that there is. Because by the time, well, even before Wuhan shut down, 7 million people had left that city. They had dispersed around the, around the whole region. Thousands of people were already carrying the virus. They had already made it to Europe. And they were pouring into all, all parts of the United States. Meanwhile, we're saying, oh, let's close the border because the we can repel this thing from China. You know, and it, it was just a, a huge underestimation of the amount of mobility that we have. Um, and it's not just people who are moving around, you know, we have animals moving around all the time too, and we that, underestimate that too. Um, and we overemphasize the negative impacts, even in our policies. So we know today that about 10% of all wild species that are introduced into a new area actually can establish themselves in those new places. Of those, only 10% cause problems that you know, we don't like, whether it's economic impacts or ecological impacts or maybe impacts to human health. So we're talking 1% of the species that are moving around into new places actually cause negative impacts of any kind at all. And yet, at the highest levels of our policymaking, we you know, in the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, for example, um, the stricture is that we should repel all species on the move before they establish themselves and before they can cause any problems. Because of course it's easier to do that, but we're basically saying for that 1%, let's throw out all the other 99% too, before they even, before anything even happens, before we even know. So it comes back to that same idea of like this reflexive sense of if they're moving around, it's a problem. We need to stop it. We need to repel it. It's going to be a disruptive, um, you know, and, and it's that reflexive conflation um, that we, we see to this day. But of course, that's only half the story. The other half of the book is really about how science has completely undermined that story. Um, you know, we have this idea of human migration as, um, as a tree, you know, that we walked out of Africa and then we populated the continents and then we basically stayed still on our separate little branches for millennia until the modern era of migration when, you know, planes and trains and fast ships made, you know, traveling around much easier. And what scientists are understanding now through paleogenetics, they've discovered how to recover the past history of migration um, by looking at ancient DNA, which they were never really able to capture before because they thought they had, you know, they would only find ancient DNA when remains had been encased in ice or in a cave or something like that. But what they've recently understood is that you can also get ancient DNA inside the petrous bone. It's one of the hardest bones in the body. It's around your, your cochlea and your ear. And so there's a lot more ancient DNA that's being recovered now and they're analyzing it and it's telling us a new story. And that story is one of not rare and intermittent migrations that happened once a long time ago and then a long period of stillness until the modern era. It's telling us a story of continuous migrations. So people walked out of Africa, they went into the Americas and they didn't just stay there. Some of them came back into Europe and went back into Asia and back into Africa. Um, people went into the most forbidding parts of the planet, not just once, not just twice, multiple times in ancient, in ancient days. 
So we had multiple waves of migration into the Tibetan plateau, the very heights of the Himal Himalayan mountains where you, there's not even enough oxygen to breathe there. We had multiple waves of migration into Polynesia, into the Polynesian islands. These are people who got into canoes, ancient people got into canoes and paddled out thousands of kilometers into open ocean to find tiny specks of land that they couldn't have seen for weeks. And they didn't just do it once by mistake, they did it over and over and over again. So there's just been, a, our history is much, you know, our history is one of continuous migration. Um, in fact, we've hardly ever been still. And when we have been still, it's been for a short time. And then we mix, we mix and move again. Um, we're seeing the same recovery of migra migration's capacity among our wild species too, where we've seen because of GPS and solar technology that scientists are now able to track animals' movements you know, continuously over their course of their lifetimes, no matter where they go, which is something very new. And what they're finding is that so many of these creatures, they don't stay within the boundaries of the little habitats that we've decided that they should stay in the camel in the Middle East, the kangaroo, you know, all of that. They're not there. They are moving way farther in more complex ways than ever before imagined. So records are being broken all the time. So why is all this happening? You know, and I try to step back in the book and to look at this bigger picture. When you look at migration in all of its fullness, now that we're learning about it and we see how myopic our view of migration has been, then you have to wonder, okay, we know that there are true disruptive effects of migration for sure. You know, we're very familiar with them. Of course there are. It's, it's hard, change is hard, it's disruptive. Um, but there has to be huge benefits that have outweighed those risks over the course of our history, over the course of our evolution, and not just for us, but for so many other species on the planet, that moving around has been what has allowed us to survive because we have evolved to do that. We've done it again and again and again. Um, and so as we're entering into this period of massive change, right? We're entering this you know, climate crisis and the habitability of the planet is being reconfigured. Um, people have to move again. Uh, animals have to move more. We're already seeing 80% of wild species are on the move right now. They are shifting their ranges. They're coming up into the poles, up into the heights, higher into the mountains in sync with the changing climate. And we see the same thing with humans. There's more people living in countries outside the countries of their birth than ever before. There's more people who've been displaced from their home than at any time since the Second World War. And I think our impulse is to see this as a crisis. And we see that in our policymaking. You know, as soon as migration became sort of conspicuous, uh, we had a whole spate of right wing populist leaders who came into power saying, well, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to pull up the fences. I'm not going to let these people in. I'm not going to allow asylum. All of these you know, efforts to repel migration as if it's something that we can stop. And, you know, they're very much looking at it as a crisis and they're going to solve the crisis by basically, you know, closing the doors on migration. But I think when you look at the bigger picture, migration is a reality. It is part of our history. And as much as we want to think of migration as a crisis, it actually could be seen in a totally different light where migration is not the catastrophe we think it is. I mean, sometimes it's a result of crises, but migration itself is the resilient response to that. It is the adaptive response to those changes. So migration in that sense is not the crisis at all. It's the solution, which is the exact opposite of, of where, where I started from thinking in the, you know, when I first started writing this book. And so it's been, a, it's been a, a, a wonderful time actually writing this book and putting it together. Um, also for me personally, to understand migration in a new light has helped me understand myself in a new way and not think of uh, myself as sort of marginal, but in fact, a migrant like everyone else, we're all connected to the story of migration in some way or another. It's part of our resilience and it's part of our heritage. It's part of the human condition as we live on this dynamic planet together. Um, so 
so that's sort of where I, you know, where I, where I kind of try to, to bring the book to, too, is to try to express some of the, that, those ideas and to t tell it as a story as much as I could. Um, so, so that, that I'll, I'll end there and I hope you guys will have some questions and we can, we have some time for Q and A. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions, please uh, ask them in the Q&A um, area at the bottom of your screens. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so again, just go to the bottom of your Zoom window and click on the Q&A icon and uh, type in your question there. Um, we do have one uh, question that's in so far from Bob. Uh, he asks, was Count Buffon's notion of American degeneracy an outgrowth of the 18th century signs that you've been describing? Yes, and I discussed Buffon in the book. There was a very Buffon was um, a French naturalist. He was around around the same time as Carl Linnaeus, and they had a very uh, a very uh, intense rivalry between them. And Buffon's idea was totally different from Linnaeus's idea. Buffon's idea was that there's so much diversity in the world because you know th there's a gradation that these are all continuous changes that there aren't hard borders between us but just like a dynamic kind of continuous grading of one species into the other one population of humans into the other um, which he saw you know and this was in the times when if there were any differences at all uh, it had to be in a hierarchy you know there wasn't really a concept of um, different you know, different categories of things that could be kind of equ equivalent, morally equivalent. So if there was any differences at all that you could see, they had to be in a hierarchy. And so Buffon's idea was that, well, all people evolved, you know, originated in the Garden of Eden and it was probably in Europe. Uh, that's what he decided. And so that's why Europeans didn't have to move very much. They just stayed around Europe and that's why they are so perfect. Um, other people had to move farther and as they did, they encountered these, you know, foreign climates that weren't very well suited to them because they're, you know, they're from the Garden of Eden. They're not used to it. And what happens as they go into these cold climates or these too hot climates or, you know, all the climates that were not, you know, France essentially he thought were negative. Um, and so his idea of North America was that everyone had degenerated there. And that's why they didn't have any good animals and they didn't have any good poetry. And he had this whole theory and Thomas Jefferson was like, no, that can't be true. Um, and there was Thomas Jefferson actually wrote a whole chapter in one of his books about, uh, about Buffon's theory of degeneracy. But in the end, you know, Buffon's theories, which were much more, um, you know, accepting of the idea of change and dynamism than Linnaeus's ideas. Uh, Linnaeus really won the day. I mean, he, he won the argument and he became the father of modern taxonomy rather than Buffon. Um, let's see. Here's one, another question. Um, what are some of the policy applications of the idea that migration is a resilient response to catastrophe? Um, well, we have, we already have some models for that. The UN has a global contact uh, that was passed just a few years ago, um, a way to make migration safe, orderly, dignified, humane, you know, and so the idea is instead of saying, okay, uh, I live in this country and here are my borders and I'm going to decide who I let in and who I don't want to let in. And if I don't want any of you people, no, you cannot come. Um, this migration is sort of a faucet, I can turn it off and on. You know, th that's sort of how our politics and our policy making is around migration is done now. Um, but what the UN Global Compact says is migration is a reality. Migration is happening whether we want it to or not. It's not something we can control. It's something that is happening. And if it's that, and we know that there are so many benefits to migration as well as costs, what we should do instead of saying, well, we don't want any migration or we only want this part or we only want this part, you know, picking and choosing. What we should be saying is let's manage migration. Let's manage it so that it can be safer. So it can be, you know, we can, we can minimize the disruptive impacts. We can minimize the costs of migration while maximizing the benefits. And that's going to look different in different places. Sometimes it's going to mean managing the pace of migration because in a lot of places, you know, the main issue is not that, people are coming and going, but if they're coming 
you know, all at once or really quickly or into certain places or, and not other places. And so these are all things we can manage. You know, we can decide, okay, well, this is where there's capacity or this is where there is more, you know, there's not enough capacity. So let's not, let's, let's send our migrants into this other place. Or maybe we want to say, let's make the places where migrants are leaving more resilient to whatever changes they're responding to. And so the pace can slow down. There's all these different ways we can do it. We could make it easier for migrants to, you know, have papers and have documentation so that we don't have this whole crisis we have right now where some people have documents and some people don't. And it really spells the difference between whether you are mobile or immobile and in many cases, life or death. Um, we don't have to do it that way. So there's actually a lot of good models out there. Um, they're still basically theoretical. I mean, I think there's one country or maybe two that have actually adopted the global compact into their national laws. So Nora um, has a similar question and I think it just is asking you to go in a little bit more detail. She says, how can a welcoming migration place slash country look like and cherish the advantage of being a place, immigrants and diversity? Are there positive examples? I think there's probably positive examples um, today, but also moments in time. Uh, I think in the United States, the history has been, you know, we've been very ambivalent about immigration. So, so at some periods in our history, we've been very accepting and some periods we haven't been. But I think we are still, even when we're doing that, we're looking at migration in a utilitarian way. So we're looking at migration of like, well, do we want migrants because we need, you know, this kind of worker? And so, yes, we do need those kind of workers. So yes, we'll, leave, we'll let them in. But we're, we're still not looking at migration as, uh, as, as sort of you know, investment that we all have to make, part of our common and shared reality that we all have to manage together. Um, we're, I don't think we're, we're really doing that yet. You know? And I think the whole idea of sort of you know, national sovereignty is, is, is tricky. Then, you know, I mean, it's not to say that you can't have borders and you can't have sovereignty. Of course you can, you know, people move all around all the time. I mean, the other part of the other part of this issue is that we don't track migration very well. So, you know, we only track certain kinds of migratory flows that we find sort of problematic or that we want to kind of scrutinize more refugees, asylum seekers, you know, these there are certain kinds of migrants that we want to count and we want to watch. But there's all this other mobility that goes on that we don't even look at. You know, we don't even track like how many people are leaving to our borders, or how many people are moving within our borders, how many are moving from one poor country to the next poor country. We're not, hardly any statistics. We don't. We hardly know about any of that. So I think a lot of migration happens beneath our notice, and it's not disruptive, and it's not you know it's not leading to societal collapse. It's just it's like the blood in our veins. It's just happening all the time, and we're you know unaware of it. But it's what is making a lot of societies function. You know, we know that for wild species, migration is what uh, allows ecosystems to flourish. And there's whole ecosystems that would collapse if you didn't have wild creatures moving around, people moving around and carrying seeds around, et cetera, you know, creating the kind of botanical scaffolding for a lot of ecosystems around the, around the planet. So, so I think the, the models are out there, but um, you know, we have a ways to go to get to a place where we can have a good faith conversation about migration and a good faith effort at policymaking around it. Um, I have a question for you. Um, when you talk about uh, migration in the natural world, um, how do you account for like invasive species and things like that? Is that something that we're overreacting to and we should just be more accepting of or? I think, so I have a whole chapter in the book about this, and uh, I sort of trace the history of how we came to think about certain species as invaders, and it was very much tied to World War II and, uh, you know, scientific ideas around, uh, you know, the onslaught and the invasion of Europe by, by the, you know, by Germans and stuff like that. But anyway, um, what we know is, and I mentioned, I think I mentioned this earlier, is that um, invasion, invasive species is certainly an issue. Like there are certain species that can come into a new place and can cause problems. Absolutely. And whether that's a problem that we, you know, we've created because, oh, we want to grow a crop here. You know, we want to grow this agricultural plant here. And so this other species that's coming in, it's a problem for us. That's not an ecological problem, but it's still a problem, right? Um, and we kind of collapse all of the problems that these species can cause together. So sometimes the problems are economic problems that, you know, well, this, this novel species that's coming in is gonna harm our honeybees and we need honeybees to pollinate our crops. Well, honeybees are also 
not native. Honeybees are from Europe. We have them here in North America. Um, and that's fine, you know, but let's not, you know, we don't have to be moralistic about it and say, well, we don't like those creatures because they're alien, because they're foreign. You know, we don't like them because they're interfering with something we're trying to do. And that's perfectly fair. And those disruptive impacts absolutely exist. But what I'm saying is that it's not because of where they're from. You know, only 1%, only 10% of species that move into a new place can establish themselves. And then only 10% of those actually cause any of these problems, whether it's human health, economic, or ecological. And that's one percent. So that's one percent of all species on the move. Ninety-nine percent of them are not causing those problems, right? So, so it's not to say that the problems aren't real. It's just they're only a very small part of the overall picture. So the whole way we're thinking about species on the move, as if well, if it's native, it's good, and if it's alien, it's bad. I think is very outdated. And even the scientists I talk to in invasion biology themselves say that you know that now we have species that are moving into new places and. Do we want to call them all aliens and repel them when a when a wild creature is trying to survive climate change and it moves farther north? Do we want to say, well, okay, that's an alien, let's not let it in? No, we don't. We want to preserve biodiversity. We want to preserve that resilience. So really what we need to do is think about this in a whole different way. It's not about where you're from. You know, it's about what is your function in this ecosystem? How can you contribute to this ecosystem? Um, and I think, you know, I think in, in that part of uh, scientific inquiry that, you know, ideas are really changing pretty, pretty quickly. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, we just had a new question come in. Um, this uh, person asks, since you mentioned that there may be less to virtually no data on certain types of human migration, how do we have any data points at all on these other types of migration? Is it individual researchers in different countries collecting this data by interviewing these other migrants and doing modeling to try to get a better uh, idea of the larger picture? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part, par partially it. I mean, we have better mobility data nowadays because of sort of big data and you can look at sort of cell phones and things like that and you can see how much movement there is. Um, we are getting really exciting new data about wildlife movements and how extensive they are. And there's actually a website called MoveBank. Um, and I, I think it's on YouTube. You can look it up, movebank.com. But this is a, a repository that scientists have come up with where they have thousands and thousands of animals that they're tracking around the globe. Uh, many of them are wearing satellite tracks, satellite tags, so that you can see where they're moving sort of all the time. And it's all being uploaded into this one uh, data center and move bank and they have these beautiful visualizations so you can see you know all the tracks of animals uh, you know moving all all around the globe I've seen similar visualizations of movements of refugees and asylum seekers and it's like this filigree that's just you know encases the whole planet it's very beautiful um, and really hypnotic when you look at it but I think we're still kind of piecing it all together I mean this was a thing this was a challenge in writing this book is like where do you go to report on migration? You know, in the end, what I learned is migration is happening everywhere. So you, there's no one place you can go and say, oh, this is where the migration is happening. It's migrations everywhere. So, uh, you know, so that, that posed a challenge. And I think we still kind of haven't really wrapped our heads around the, the total scale of migration, which in a way is just like, you know, the human experience. We're moving around all the time at different time scales. So, so putting it all together is, a, is I think, is, a, is definitely a challenge. Well, we have one final question, and it is a bit off topic, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think it applies a little bit to your earlier books. Um, it's about the uh, origin of the COVID virus. This person wants to know, is there any credibility that it could have come from outer space in one of the capsules that came back? Um, it's very closely related to the virus, the earlier SARS virus, so I, no, I don't think there's... I don't, I haven't heard of any credible scientist who has, you know, theorized that it's anything other than something related to the earlier SARS virus. And we know where the earlier SARS virus came from. It came from bats. And from bats, it went into civet cats and then entered humans. Um, and this is broadly happening because humans are destroying so much bat habitat through deforestation. So when you cut down the trees where the bats live, they don't just disappear. They go live in your, you know, backyards and farms and gardens instead. 
and that facilitates different kinds of interactions with bats, whether it's uh, trade, wildlife trade in bats or hunting of bats or, you know, wet markets where bats are kept or just casual contact with bats. Um, and so through those, all of those new kinds of ways we're interacting with bats, um, we're getting a lot of bat viruses spilling over into humans, not just the first SARS and, and probably this, this one that we're experiencing right now, but also Ebola and uh, uh, Nipah. There's a bunch of other uh, viruses that we get from bats. Rabies, of course, is the most famous one, but there's a whole, there's a whole load of them. Okay, great. Um, well, if there's no other questions, um, I just want to thank you very much for uh, this really fascinating presentation. Um, I think we all learned a lot tonight and um, a lot to think about, and I would encourage everyone to purchase The Next Great Migration. There's a link in the chat that you can click on and go to politicsandpros.com. Um, and Sonia, thank you so much. Uh, this was really excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It's nice talking to you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Take Good care. Good night.